Do you recognize that sax solo? If you're around my age and from Long Island like I am, you know that's the sax solo from Billy Joel's hit song, New York State of Mind. In this video, I'm gonna analyze that solo and we're gonna go over some of the techniques used and then I'm gonna show you how you can learn how to play some of that stuff in your own solos. J. Metcalf here from bettersax.com and if you like saxophone lesson videos like the one you're about to watch, do me a quick favor and drop me one of these right now and also consider subscribing to the channel. We are just about to hit 200,000 subscribers which is amazing. Thank you for all the support over the years and all the wonderful comments you guys leave me. Now this sax solo has a bit of an odd story because it's not actually the original version you would hear on a hard copy of the Turnstiles album where it was originally released in 1976. The song New York State of Mind was re-released on the Billy Joel's Greatest Hits Volume 1 and Volume 2 album with a new sax solo by I'm pretty sure Mark Rivera, who replaced Richie Cannata as the sax player in Billy Joel's band in 1982 and has been with him ever since. I grew up hearing this newer version of the solo because I had the greatest hits album and that's what I listened to all the time. The first time I actually heard the original version of the song with the original sax solo, it, it was like being in this weird alternate reality because everything else in the song was identical. It was very strange. I've never heard of a solo being re-recorded for a re-release of a song. In the liner notes on the Greatest Hits album, it doesn't say anything about this re-recorded sax solo, but there was another track released on this album and you can see Mark Rivera was playing the synth harmonica, whatever that is, along with John Faddis and Ronnie Cuber. So I'm not 100% sure that this is Mark Rivera's solo, but it sure does sound like him. It is definitely not Phil Woods though, as some people have supposed on various internet forums. I wrote this solo out for you so that you can follow along and I put a link in the description below to the Better Sax Shed where you can download this PDF and all my other free downloadable learning resources. Click the link fill out the form on that page and then you get an email that'll give you access. It's a good idea to add bettersax.com to your list of safe sender domains so that those emails don't end up in your junk or spam folders. This solo is pretty easy to play. It's only got one altissimo note, which is A, and that's one of the easiest altissimo notes to hit. It's a great example of a very melodic solo that uses lots of pentatonic scale lines, but also arpeggiates the chords to outline the harmony, it has a couple of bebop licks in there and some blues scale lines for good measure. In this genre, I feel that melodic solos work very well. There's no need to do anything too flashy or play tons of notes. The audience is not generally the jazz crowd. They just want a beautiful sax tone and something to hum along to. Now, if you play some altissimo near the end at the peak of the solo, you are much more likely to get applause from the audience. You don't need a lot though. One really well-placed altissimo note can do the trick. Altissimo is like the drum solo of the saxophone. Whatever the gig is, drum solos get applause. The audience could literally be asleep and the drummer starts taking a solo and they will all wake up to go, woohoo! Tell me I'm wrong. The first thing we're gonna wanna do in this solo and really any solo we transcribe is to learn the chord changes. Knowing the chord changes is gonna help us understand the note choices and how the harmony is being outlined and resolved in different spots. It's also gonna help us play our own variations on this solo or improvise something entirely new, which is the reason why we transcribe and analyze solos in the first place, right? I'm gonna be talking in concert key here, so saxophonist, remember, you're gonna to have to transcribe for your instrument. So we're in the key of C here. We start out in the first bar on the one chord, and then it goes to the three dominant chord, which resolves to the six chord, the minor six chord. Now, you know, Billy Joe was a big Ray Charles fan. And when he originally wrote this song, he wanted Ray Charles to sing it. Um, 
And it's interesting that these this chord progression is the same as the beginning of Georgia, which is the song Ray Charles is probably best known for. Georgia, Georgia, the whole day through. Or some folks like to get away, take a holiday. Not a coincidence. The next measure, we have a 2-5, resolving to the four chord. This chord progression can be found in 73% of all jazz standards, so it's a good one to know. Now from there, we go up to A7, which then resolves to D minor. Think of this as the Georgia chord progression now played up a fourth. Now to get us back to the tonic C, we have this B flat dominant chord, which we call a backdoor dominant. Again, a very common jazz harmonic device. Now you might be asking yourself, wait, is this a jazz tune? I thought Billy Joe was rock or pop music. Rock and pop music use sophisticated harmony all the time, which is why you should study music theory and harmony regardless of the genre of music you want to learn. Moving on now, we're back in the key of C. We have this descending bass line on the major scale with these diatonic triads in various inversions on top. <laughs> This is a very common device in pop music that you're going to hear all the time. So now we're on this two chord, this secondary dominant or five of five, which sets up this very common pop music cadence for five, and you're expecting it to go to one, which would sound like this. I'm in New York, stand of mine. But it doesn't do that because that would be kind of boring. Instead, it does this. Because I'm in New York. State of mind. It goes to A minor and then to D7, back to A minor, and then to the five chord, which brings us back to one at the top of the form. What a great little chord progression, right? All of those chords are included in the PDF download I mentioned earlier. Now let's check out the solo so we can see how the notes relate to the chords. And incidentally, this is really the trick to playing an effective solo on a song like this that has lots of harmonic movement. You can't just stick to one pentatonic scale here or it's going to sound wrong. You really have to follow the chords if you want to get something that sounds good. The first phrase is straight up major pentatonic scale. Uh, it also paraphrases the melody nicely, which is a very effective way to start a solo. The next phrase outlines the E7 chord with this simple arpeggiation that resolves to the A minor chord with this escape tone thing. And finishes with an A minor pentatonic line. Remember that the C major and the A minor pentatonic scales are exactly the same notes. And if you'd like to learn more about those, you can do so in my pentatonic foundation course and my free play sax by ear crash course, both of which are linked in the description below. The next phrase is in the new key of F and it's just F major pentatonic. Notice the two 16th note pickup note motif. We're gonna hear more of that. And notice how he voice leads very smoothly with a half step into the A chord, uh, arpeggiating it twice. Great stuff so far, very simple, tasteful, and very effective. Now we have this very public domain bebop lick. If you don't know any bebop licks yet, this is a good one to start with. I think it was the first one I ever learned. It's on this 2-5 chord progression. We go straight up to two chord, the D minor 7 chord, uh, playing the Dorian scale, and then it resolves to the G7 chord. And then goes down the G bebop scale starting on the third.
in the next measure or on the backdoor dominant B flat seven chord. And yes, he plays the internet's favorite, the lick. But he doesn't finish it, he just plays the first part. It still counts. So you see, you can play bebop and jazz lines in a pop setting and it can work very well. But now we're getting towards the end of the solo and if we're gonna do this right and get everyone at Madison Square Garden cheering, we've got to start building up to that altissimo climax. So we are now in rock mode for the next several bars. Only pentatonic scale and blue scale are gonna be used. Notice that two note, 16th note pickup motif again. Repeating a rhythmic idea like this while varying a few notes is super effective and it connects well with the audience. The last line here is a blues scale lick. There's kind of like this unwritten rule when improvising solos, but if you play a blues lick like that, towards the end it, sing it signals that the solo is coming to an end. It's a good thing to know when you're learning how to improvise. Listen out for that in your favorite solos. You're gonna hear it all the time. Now he saves the altissimo climax for this little two bar extension in the song. Now that's a high A, an altissimo A. If you're gonna be playing saxophone in any sort of pop or rock setting, learn how to play altissimo A it will serve you well, trust me. This note usually pops right out and plays pretty well in tune, but if you need help with learning how to play in the altissimo range, check out my videos on the topic here on YouTube. After the solo, the song actually goes to the bridge, which is in A minor, the relative minor to C major. So the last chord is E7, and he outlines it similarly to how we did it in bar three earlier. And the last three notes he plays of the solo is ba da da, three, two, one, landing on one of the new key A minor. Do yourself a favor and get used to ending solos on the root or on the tonic. It feels resolved, it feels final, it communicates to the audience that, yes, I've ended my solo now. Um, it's a good place to start to, to get strong endings to your solos. Coming up as a freelance saxophone player on Long Island, I played a lot of these solos in cover bands over the years. And for iconic songs like this one, it's a good idea to at least know the original version of the solo. Usually there's only one version. Uh, so that you can either play it verbatim or at least play something that reminds the audience of what they're expecting to hear. It's also a great study in how to build your own solos. Learn how to play a bunch of really good solos that work well, and that's gonna help you when it's time to improvise your own solos. The key is in the storytelling. This solo tells a story and has the arc of a good story. And that's really the challenge when playing solos and one of the things you should be looking to learn when transcribing them. I also encourage everyone to go learn the music you grew up with and loved in your youth. Whatever that is, the process of doing that is wonderfully empowering and fun. If you'd like to learn more from me about playing the saxophone by ear or improvising solos, you can check out my online courses over at bettersax.com where I've helped thousands of students get better at playing the saxophone. Don't forget to sign up for the Better Sax Shed where you can download the PDF of this solo and lots of other free saxophone learning resources. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.